today's story, it's so funny. It's like if you could go, we heard Jesus, we talked a lot about Jesus and being a disciple last week. And if you could go as far back to the opposite end of the spectrum, that's, that's pretty much where we're going to be today. Because today's story is about what it truly means to follow God. There's a word, and it's called faith. Now, I am curious. This is where we have some audience participation. If you were asked to explain faith to somebody who was unfamiliar with Christianity, what are some things you would say? It's a gift. I like it because that means it's not from you. It's okay. I love that. It's it's, can't earn it. Can't earn it. I thought you said con artist. And I was like, (laughs) you've been watching too much Christian TV, mister. I'm just kidding. You can't earn faith. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, give me some more. What, what, like, what does faith look like? What, what are some words you'd use? Believe. Believe. What, life, is that what I heard? Blind. 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 I thought you said lying. I'm like, I need to get my hearing changed. <laughs> Why am I hearing the opposite? I'm hearing only bad things. Blind faith, okay. Trust. 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 Anything? What? Hope. Hope. Believe, oh yeah, so very practical. Believing right now, you have faith that your house is still there, but you're not there to know. But you believe it. Unconditional. Unconditional. See, these are good words. And there are a lot of ways to express faith, but I think it's hard, don't you? I mean, it's a hard question. I actually got more answers than I expected. I expected those looks like I would have given. (laughs) I did. Every Easter and Christmas, you see it. On TV, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, Dateline NBC, Time Magazine. You see all of the, um, the beliefs of Christianity being investigated, right? And, and sometimes, well, and let me, virgin birth, resurrection, uh, miracles, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes the shows and the articles are fair. Sometimes they're not. But almost every single time you watch these, these shows or, or, or read these articles... The final analysis says that no one can really know one way or the other. That decisions like believing in God, following Jesus, these are matters of blind faith. They're blind faith. You can't know for sure or anything, so you just have to trust. Now, there is an old joke about a kid who was asked by his mom, what did you learn in Sunday school? And he said, mom, Faith is believing what you know ain't so. (laughs) The great theologian Archie Bunker (laughs) said, Faith is believing what nobody would believe if it weren't in the Bible. Is that the definition of faith? I hope not. But I think the bottom line is that people often believe That real life, you know, reason, logic, stuff that you can really know, that's based on evidence. But faith, faith is is based on those beliefs where there is no evidence to back it up. Do you agree? I mean, is that what faith is? It's believing stuff without evidence? Or, Or worse, like that little boy said, it's believing things when the evidence actually goes against my beliefs? See, I think this question of faith is why students in droves are leaving the church when they go to college, because they've been taught things all their life, but they've never really wrestled with the questions of faith. We said at the beginning of this whole series, like, what was that, two years ago? I can't remember. Um, Yeah, thanks. Uh, At the beginning of the series, we said that we talked a lot about pain and suffering, and we said that pain and suffering, one of the things that come out of it is that we wrestle with faith in ways that we never would have, and it changes us, and it makes us uh, stronger, and um, a lot of students have not had that. They haven't wrestled with the questions, and so when they are presented with really strong evidence that goes against what they've always been taught, well, they leave, and honestly, most of us would too. I asked a similar question at the beginning of summer. How many of you, excuse me, how many of you, I said, make me sound like a man. Um, (laughs) Not going through puberty. He's like, I'm doing the best I can, man. (laughs) Technology cannot fix you, Don. Um, (laughs) How many of you struggle now or have struggled in the past with doubt concerning God 
or the Bible? Raise your hand. How many of you have either struggled now or in the past with doubt? I'm raising my hand. Yeah, it's good, good. A lot of hands went up when I said that. We're all in it. It's okay. Doubt is not unbelief. It's not. Doubt is questions. I have questions that have not been answered. By the way, questions are healthy. But it, because doubt is, is honest. I mean, doubt's... We, we have doubt because of tragedy. We have doubt because of a job loss. We have doubt because Hurricane Irma comes through and destroys so much of Florida. It causes doubt. How do you trust God when you think that life is not how it should be? How do you trust God? And that's why we're in today's story. Because we are talking today about one of the oldest stories in Scripture. And it's so amazing how similar in some ways it is to ours. This story is four thousand years old it's it when jesus was born this story was as old as jesus's story is to us this is an old story this story was a thousand one thousand years that is a long time before king david this story is hundreds of years before moses it's a story about the man who's who was foundational to the jewish faith this is the man who was foundational to the muslim faith which would come, be, you know, be created 2,600 years after he, this man was born. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, good, Abraham. We found a Polaroid. <laughs> and the reason I picked this picture is, doesn't it look like he's trying to get a, God to throw him a ball? I don't know why. That just cracks me up. But, uh, but I know this is a real picture, so that's why I put it up. <laughs> Abraham is like the original man of faith. And his story starts in Genesis 12. And so I, I wanted to read some of the story to you because it's good. This is a good story. It says, the Lord said, now his name was originally Abram, and God later changed it to Abraham. But for the sake of ease, I'm just going to say Abraham the whole time. Is that cool? All right. The Lord had said to Abram or Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Abraham, leave everything you know, and I will bless you with land, descendants, a legacy, and purpose. And he continues. There it is. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, so let me ask you something. Why did Abraham believe in God? Why, why did Abraham go? Faith, but what was, the, what, was, what was the reason? How did he even know to go? He heard, he heard God. God told him. That was the evidence. God revealed himself. That was how he knew that he should go. Now, I don't know how God spoke to Abraham. I don't. The Bible doesn't tell us. Was it an angel? Was it a voice from the sky? Was it through a person? I have no idea. But I do know this, however it happened, don't you wish God talked to you that way? <laughs> I mean, Lord, I don't know what job to take. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I don't know what direction in my life I should go. Could you just text me? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, we are all like that. I get it. But in this situation, God spoke to Abraham and promised that he would be a great nation, which was unexpected since Abraham's wife couldn't have children. It's hard to be a great nation, have a lot of descendants, if you can't have kids. And he promised that God would bless Abraham with land, land that he didn't even know where it was or what it looked like. He promised him a legacy, that he would be known throughout the world. And he promised, and what a promise this is, that all people of the earth, he didn't even know where all these people lived. I mean, it's not like they had the internet, you know? All people of the earth would be blessed through him. That is quite a promise. But there's a catch. He had to do something. What did he have to do? He had to leave his home for an unknown future. He had to trust God no matter what happened. Now, Abraham was originally, he lived um, in what's called Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures today. Some of them are meant to be funny. Some of them are meant to make you go, oh, okay. And some of them are just a map to kind of give you some... Uh, some help. So if you served in the military in the last 20 years, so, um, you, I guess the last 15 years, you're familiar with Ur 
Because this is modern day Basra in Iraq. That's Abraham's home, Basra, just above Kuwait. And um, to, God told him to leave your country, your people, and your family. And this was an incredibly difficult command. Because while there were definitely people who traveled all over selling stuff and trading, most people stayed in one place. They stayed where they were. And, and your people in this time were your protection. Your people was your family, your identity. I, I, I don't know if, you know, if you read the Old Testament, my daughter was reading it some this week, and she was like, Dad, this is not what I expected, some of these stories, because they're terrible. They're terrible. Because the ancient civilization was barbaric. They're terrible. There's some terrible stories in the Bible. Because ancient civilization was so rough. I mean, in a city which was pretty much as big as some of the places God at the time. In a city, you'd have laws. There'd be a king or whatever. But if you left that city, you were on your own. And, and Abraham's told to go a thousand miles away. Leave your city. Leave your family. Leave your identity. Leave your inheritance. Leave everything that you know is secure for a great, great promise. They were asked to give up everything meaningful, and that it took a lot of trust on their part, especially since they were old. They were never able to have kids. But Abraham stepped out. He, took that, he started that 1,000-mile journey to a land he'd never seen. And you'd think when somebody follows God that things are going to be easy, right? <laughs> no, that's never been my experience. If you say, well, yeah, I, I accepted Jesus, and uh, you know, all the lines at, at the store started getting shorter, and... <laughs> I never, McDonald's never messed up my order, and I mean, life just got so, so easy. I was at McDonald's this morning, that's why I said that, and they messed up my order, that's why I said that. Um, yeah, sorry, I just realized, you know, you can offend everybody when you're up here. Um, but life's not easy when you follow God. Mine hasn't been, most of yours hasn't been, and it wasn't easy for Abraham. Look at his journey. Here's a couple of pictures. Okay, when he started, he, he started up the Euphrates River. This is a picture of what it looks like today. How much different did it look 4,000 years ago? I keep looking online. I can't find those Polaroids. So, but you're like, that's not so bad, you know? And at about 20 miles a day is what a caravan of people would take. You know, you're thinking this is going to be a two-month journey. But less than halfway, it starts to look like this. And you're like, uh, really, God? <laughs> this is kind of hot. Where's the water? I need some air conditioning really bad. Oh, and did we mention the storms? Hello. And you're like, what in the world? I mean, this is like, looks like it's right out of the movie The Mummy. You know, you're like, I can't even believe these storms. Every, you know, I don't, that's not a hurricane, a sandstorm, Irma? I don't know. This is crazy. And so things started really getting bad. Do we, honey, Sarah, do we really want to go to the land of promise? I mean, is this it? Wow. Let's go back to Ur. But there's one more thing. It says, so Abraham went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he set out to, from Haran, which was about the halfway point. So let me remind you, he's 75 years old desert. <laughs> it's like, no U-Haul. Just grab the wife, grab the camels, grab the Ben Gay. Let's start this journey, baby. I mean, this is like, I can't even imagine walking through this when I'm 75. I can't imagine when I'm 46 years old walking through this. Um, and this is where he was. And then months later, he finally arrived somewhere because he doesn't know what it is or where, where he didn't have a map probably. And, and it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he arrives into the Jordan Valley, right here, somewhere in here. And, and I'm sure he's like, at least there's green. <laughs> We're just happy. There's water and there's green. And he's given a promise that as far as your eye can see, Abraham, this land, you will pass down to your kids. Did I mention he was 75 years old and didn't have kids? All right. They spent their whole lives trying to get pregnant. But they accepted that 
You know, maybe that wasn't God's will, but now there's this promise about them having kids. You know, and even if they had kids, I'm sure, you know, when you're 75 years old, raising kids can't be that hard, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I know. And we're all like, I know, God gives kids to young people. There's a reason, because it's hard. And then, I mean, literally right about this time when he arrives, he finds out that there's a drought and a famine in Canaan, and that he has to go to Egypt. And he's like, you know, you can just imagine Abraham. Seriously, God, I've been faithful. I've done what you've said. Can't something work out the way I expect? Can't something be okay and not hard, extra hard? Because in their mind, just like in our mind 4,000 years later, being faithful meant blessing. And blessing for him meant food, water, land, animals, all the things that he had before he chose to follow God. And now he has none of them. Maybe he had some animals, but he had left everything. What's up with that? And then he's like, hey, honey, I know we just got here, but I hear there's food and water over in Egypt. So put on your hiking boots. We only got 200 more miles to go. No, no, no. I don't, I really, it's Egypt. I hear Egypt is great. I hear it's not that bad. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> now, I realize all of the trip wasn't this way. But even if there was a mile of this, I'm giving up. <laughs> it's a tough journey. Anybody feel like this is how it always seems to go? <laughs> that, you know, you have, you have direction or you think you're going somewhere and you're going to do something and then it looks like this. And you're like, this is not what I expected. This is not how I expected life to be. Finally, when the famine and the drought ended, they trudged the 200 miles back to the promised land. And you can imagine, okay, God, we're finally here. You can give me a son. I'll have the son. And then years went by and no son. Years. Sarah didn't get pregnant and God was just quiet. They traveled across the known world, left their family and friends in silence. For years, silence. And then Sarah said, maybe I'm not the one. Maybe we messed up. Maybe I'm not the one who's supposed to have the baby. And so she had this beautiful young servant named Hagar. And Sarah told ha Abraham, maybe you're supposed to get Hagar pregnant, which was, fair, which was culturally and socially expected and, and normal. And I'm sure Abraham was like looking at the young Hagar going, I'm supposed to get her pregnant? I mean, if I have to, <laughs> you know. And uh, I hope that was okay to say. I just thought it was, just, <laughs> it was hysterical in my mind. Um, and then it says, Abraham, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now, do you remember how old he was when this started? 75. So, and he's 86 now. So Abraham's given a promise. He does everything he's asked, and then he doesn't hear from God for 11 years. Now he's 86. He's finally given a son from Hagar. And for Abraham, for Sarah, and for Hagar, this had to be the promised son. This, obviously, this was the son that was promised. And look at the very next verse. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, What? 75 to 86, 11 years of silence. Now he has the baby, and 13 years go by before he hears anything again. You're like, what in the world? And, and God says to him, no, you and Sarah, Abraham, you and Sarah, your wife, are going to have a son. He will be the one who fulfills the promise that I made to you 24 years ago. And then Sarah got pregnant, gave birth to her son Isaac. And it's from Abraham and Isaac, whom all the Jews came from. And you're like, what in the world? For 24 years, Abraham had been obeying God with, without the promise being fulfilled. Day after day, Life did not look the way he expected it to look, but he followed God anyway, and he trusted anyway. Why? Because he had heard from God. He heard, that was his evidence. It wasn't blind faith. He trusted because God had told him, this is what you need to do. Here's the promise. He never told him how long the promise would take. He was walking because of what he had seen and what he had heard. And though it didn't look like what he expected, he just kept trusting. 
And because of that willingness to trust God, Abraham is, is like the giant in Christian faith and in Jewish faith and in Muslim faith. I mean, Abraham is such a big deal because he was faithful and righteous. Was he righteous because he was such a good person? No, because I left out tons of the story. Abraham messed up a lot. He lied. He did a bunch of stuff. But, oh, it sounds like us. (laughs) He was just like us. He was a normal human being who had a lot of messes in his life, but he did one thing right. He trusted God. And because he trusted God, he was, he was claimed, deemed righteous. His heart was God's. And look how it even impacts us today. This is in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he said, Abraham believed God. Nothing about what he did. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith, not just Jewish people, not just people who are born of Abraham, but those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, that's everybody who's not Jewish, by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham when he said in Genesis 12, 3, all nations will be blessed through you. See, Abraham was given a promise. That promise was fulfilled in Jesus. And because of Jesus, all people on earth are part or can be part of one family, the family of God. Abraham is such an example of faith for us. And But yeah, what does that mean for me? I've, I've never heard God speak to me audibly. And if you have, I want you to come tell me about it later because I haven't. So what does faith look like for us today? I was thinking about this this week and I was like, I need an example of faith in everyday life because faith in God is big and it's like you're trusting something that you can't see and it's hard. But so let's use an illustration that makes sense for us. And I don't know why it came to my mind, but I asked myself, why do I have faith in in a real estate agent? Because think about what you do for a real estate agent. You give them the keys to your house. You give them the authority to sell your most valuable possession. (laughs) Who does that? We do. And you trust them that when they're showing the house, You leave, and they're not going to steal anything. That is a lot of faith. Why do you put trust in a real estate agent? Maybe they're a friend. We have real estate agents in our church, and we trust them because we know them. Or or maybe you trust the company that they're associated with, and you're like, that company is a big deal. If they ever did anything wrong, like sell my house out from under me or whatever, nobody would use them, so you, okay, there's that. Or maybe you trust the real realtor because... A lot of other people have used them and had success. But what, whatever the reason, then there's a variety of reasons. Whatever the reason you trust a real estate agent, it's because there is a lot of evidence that says you can have faith in them. It still takes faith. You're giving them your keys. You're, you're letting them go into your home. I mean, that's a lot of faith. But there's reasons for the faith. It's not just blind. It's like there's reasons. It's why we get in planes, which Abraham would think is absolutely crazy. He would, but we think it's normal because there's a lot of evidence that says it's okay to fly in a plane. It's safer than driving in a car, we hear. It's why we allow doctors to operate on us. Talk about faith. You're letting a doctor cut you open. That's scary. There there has to be some really good reasons to allow that, and we have them. There's evidence for our faith, but it still takes faith to allow that doctor to give you anesthesia and go out. It takes a lot of faith, and it's hard, and it's scary. But it's, we do it. We have faith because of the overwhelming evidence. Let me ask you this. When we have faith in anything, in realtors, doctors, planes, anything, does it always go the way we expect? Of course not. Sometimes a realtor just can't sell your house. Sometimes the plane breaks down and you're stuck on the tarmac for four hours or whatever the law is now. Thank goodness they changed it. So now it's only torture for half your life, it feels like. And maybe maybe the doctor's wrong. Unexpected things happen all the time. Doesn't change the fact that we still put our faith in things. It's just unexpected. And Abraham shows us that following God usually is not how we expect it to go. And we see it throughout the Bible. I mean, you think about every story. Job lost everything. Israel was exiled. Paul was killed. Peter 
was killed. James was killed. And then you think, the son of God was killed by crucifixion. Faith is trusting God through the good times and the bad, even when it doesn't look like what we expect it's going to look like, even when it doesn't turn out the way we expect. It's trusting God with hope. And the hope is not that everything's going to be smooth here on earth. The hope is that in the end, it is all going to be all right. It is all going to work out okay. It might be 24 years like it was for Abraham. It might be 46 years. It might be the rest of your life. You might be like Peter and die for this promise. But one day, and there is going to be a day, it's all going to be good. The hope is that it's all going to be okay. No matter what tragedy we've gone through, no matter how hard it gets or how unexpected it is, it's going to be okay. And let me tell you, that is hope. That makes me excited. That even, you know, and I shared my story uh, way, way, you know, two years ago when when we started this series about my wife passing away. Even that, it's going to be okay. Crazy. God does not call you to trust in him without first revealing himself or providing evidence that he can be trusted. And that's how I want to end with with some of this. Because in the Old Testament, God talked with Abraham. He talked with him. God did incredible miracles through Moses and the, the Israelites as they were following Moses. I mean, they wanted to turn and go back to Egypt all the time because it, it was slavery, but at least it was something that they knew. It wasn't unexpected. But they kept following Moses because of miracles and God's provision and God was doing things over and over. When you see the Red Sea part, I'm sure you're like, okay, we're in for right now. You know, it's the way it is. He saved all of Israel from slavery in Egypt. God kept fulfilling these amazing prophecies that he was spe- that was spoken through the prophets and some of the prophecies that were fulfilled are mind blowing continually providing evidence follow me it's not going to look like what you think but it will be okay i'm worthy of being trusted and then the biggest prophecy until jesus was that the <laughs> the whole nation of judah was exiled and the prophets were saying in 70 years you're going to return No, but they're like, no, that's impossible. We've just been exiled. We've been made to go to where Abraham was originally from, to Persia and to Babylon. They moved the people all the way to where Abraham was originally from. And the prophets are going, you're going to return. You're going to return. And the guy's name's going to be Cyrus, who does it. And 70 years later, the Babylonians are they are destroyed by the Persians. And the Persians come up with this new way of thinking and they go, let's allow all the exiles to return back to their homes because they will be loyal to us. And the, those from Judah were allowed, the Jews were allowed to go home. When that happened, they were in. They're like, so much evidence, we're following. But then look at the New Testament because we have Jesus, the ultimate revelation of God. God in the flesh. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus raised people from the dead. And then when Jesus died, on that third day, he was raised from the dead. He talked with his disciples. He ate with his disciples. The resurrection is the greatest evidence, the greatest reason for our faith that exists. It is the basis for our Christianity. And the same power, gosh, this gets me excited, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is transforming us. It, he, it lives in us and is making us more and more like Jesus. I think, I think that transformation is the best evidence that exists for our faith. We do not have a blind faith. There is so much evidence for our faith. Think about it. Those first disciples were tortured and killed for their faith, Right? Those were the same disciples that a couple of weeks earlier, like before they started teaching and doing all this great stuff, ran away from Jesus because they were scared. They abandoned Jesus. And in three, four, five weeks, something like that, they went from abandoning Jesus to boldly proclaiming him that he is alive in a way that got them killed. Now, they either, I mean, they were the eyewitnesses. They either saw the risen Jesus or they were lying. And I don't know anybody who willingly dies for a lie. You know, we might believe in them and die. And they might have been wrong, and we don't know that. So we'll, we'll die for our beliefs. 
But they didn't die just for a belief. They were eyewitnesses and they died. And I don't know anybody who does that unless it's true. And in their death, in their death, Christianity spread like wildfire and changed the whole world. See, I think transformation of people's lives is the best evidence for faith. When I chose to follow Jesus, my life changed. There are people in this room right now who were able to overcome addiction to drugs or alcohol because they chose to follow Jesus. I know stories in this room right here, marriages that were saved because they chose to follow Jesus and they started being transformed on the inside. Relationships in this room have been restored because people were given the power to change and forgive. I mean, they could, they could never have forgiven. But because Jesus, because they chose to follow Jesus, his spirit has transformed their life and they were able to forgive something that was unforgivable. Raise your hand if you, your life has been transformed in some way because you placed your faith in Jesus. I want you to look around. There are a lot of hands up. See, this is the best evidence. You can put your hand down. The best evidence that our faith is worthy to have. That when, the, when things look so different than what we expect, and when 24 years has gone by and the promise hasn't been fulfilled, it's this that says, no, 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 you're not crazy. You're not crazy. It just doesn't look like what you expect. But your faith, your faith, you have good reason to have it. You know, some of the most respected people in the world have invested the, games, the, the, the claims of Christianity and they've chosen to follow Jesus. This week, I was going to give you a lot of different examples. And so I Googled famous Christians, and I could not believe the names that came up. And then I Googled Christian sci- modern Christian scientists. You'd be blown away. Blown away. Hundreds of the most prestigious professors and engineers and inventors are currently followers of Jesus. These are people who have been trained their entire educational life to only believe in the evidence. And these people are convinced that the evidence points to Jesus. Man, that's exciting. Faith is trusting God, no matter how uncertain the future is. I, you know, as I was like, what is a verse that would just be good to marinate on in our mind? And it sounds so funny because... It comes from the Proverbs. And I was thinking for this week, this would be a great verse to memorize. Got a pen in front of you. You might want to write it down. Many of you have already memorized it. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. I mean, think about it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Choose to trust him. It's a choice. Abraham was not forced to go. God said go, and he went. He chose to trust. Do not lean on your own understanding. Because your own understanding says you do this, you're going to get this. You need to recognize that things aren't always going to go the way you expect. Acknowledge that you don't see the whole picture. You don't, we don't. We're humans. We can't see the whole picture. But in all of our ways, submit to him. Jesus said, die to yourself. Desire God's kingdom purposes over your own purposes. I think a couple of weeks ago we said, choose this epic story instead of your own little infomercial. Choose his purposes. Die to yourself. Submit to him and he will make your path straight. It's crazy. And Jesus said, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That is so backwards to the way we normally think. We lose our lives, we willingly give them up to Jesus, and all of a sudden we find life in a way we never could have experienced before. He will make your path straight. Faith is not about you. It is not about the one believing. It is about the one you believe in. And God is a big God who can plan things out 24 years ahead like he did for Abraham and fulfill that promise. But it took Abraham's willingness to not acknowledge his own ways and to trust. And in the end, we are Christians today. We follow God today because of that man's faith. That's a big answer to the, that's a big answer to the promise that he would bless all the nations. 
So God invites us to partner with him. God in, says he will take our mess and bring unexpected beauty from it if we choose to follow him. So what is our response? Follow him. What does that look like? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's amazing how these themes keep coming up over and over and over. But that is what he says. Follow me. Love me with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Outside of that, everything else will fall into place. Trust me. So my prayer is may we follow God with our whole heart. May we be beautiful. I thought that was me. I was like, <laughs> unselfish fragrance to the world around us. Let's pray together. God, Abraham's story is amazing to me because a 24-year wait for a promise that changed all of history just blows me away. Abraham had no idea that was going to happen. He just had a promise. God, I pray that you help us to walk in faith. I pray that you help us to trust you when, when just the world is going crazy around us. Jesus, I pray for those of us who call ourselves followers of Christ that this story will motivate us and excite us and give us the courage to just take the next step. For those of us in here who have not chosen to follow Jesus, I pray that Abraham's example will be that final thing that says, you know what, it's worthy. I want to follow Jesus too. The answer to the promise. God, we're yours. This church is your family and we're privileged to have that. So I pray, God, that this family will be your hands and feet to each other, to the world around us, as we choose to follow you by faith. It's in your name we pray. Amen.